The first to speak will be Professor Adam Balin, who is Chair of the British Fertility Society and a consultant in reproductive medicine and surgery at the Leeds Centre for Reproductive Medicine. So we all know that this was started by the Panorama <coughs> programme that actually was broadcast on the same day as two papers came out in the BMJ, but it was actually cited in these well-known learned journals, The Sun and The Mail, but also sadly found its way into NHS choices, so it excited a huge amount of publicity. My strap line to this is, does an add-on have to result in a live birth? And really, we should be leading the debate, not the BBC. But in fact, we, that is, the British Fertility Society, the college here in which you sit, and the HFEA started the discussion years ago and have published widely. And we have guidelines, and I've cited two here, the BFS Policy and Practice paper on adjuvants in IVF, and the college published also on the role of natural killer cells, the use of intralipids. So we do have guidelines that we, that we publish and that we expect our members to adhere to. And the HFEA have developed a traffic light system <coughs> that I know Sally will uh, deal with probably in some <coughs> detail in, his, in her talk. But let's go back to the birth of, of uh, Louise Brown almost 39 years ago. And I'd like to remind you that Patrick Steptoe and Bob Edwards treated 250 patients over 467 cycles, only a quarter of which resulted in embryo transfer, to achieve the live birth of Louise Brown. So the live birth rate of 0.21% per cycle started. We now have 6 million babies at least in the world born as a result of IVF, with a, with a current pregnancy rate at the moment in the UK of around about 35%. So, when they were introduced, where was the evidence for all of these? I'm not going to list them, but this is how we do IVF now, which evolved over time. ICSI, for example, whereby we inject a sperm into an egg, was a serendipitous discovery. There were no RCTs. Um, it came into, the, into, into clinical use because we're an innovative sector with rapid advancement. We endeavor to be responsible, and we have tight particularly in the UK, tight, but at the same time, permissive regulation. So we are probably the most strongly regulated sector in the UK. Turn briefly to these two papers, which we think were inherently flawed, scientifically flawed, and eight minutes doesn't allow me to say why, other than 61 of the top experts in the UK wrote to the BMJ and had a rebuttal of this paper published. I was the first author, Leslie Reagan, president of, of the RCOG, was the second author, and 61 other experts. Bennett Goldacre, I think, he, it is interesting that he's a co-author. His well-known book on bad science is actually truly reflected in his own paper, these papers in the BMJ, which were inherently thawed, flawed. Carl Hennigan told Panorama that this was one of the worst examples he'd ever seen in healthcare. We know, though, that GPs knowingly hand out antibiotics for viral infections, and antibiotic resistance is one of the biggest crises in modern medicine. So we have to put this into perspective. The debate on add-ons, of course, is important. We are, of course, open to criticism. We have to scrutinize the ethics of our own clinical practice. And at the same time, we have to challenge unjustified claims for e efficacy of unproven treatments. But the two papers were inherently flawed because they listed a whole load of so-called add-ons, many of which were necess necessary investigations that we all before perform before couples undergo fertility treatment, and some were essential <coughs> treatments with a clearly defined role. For example, men with an, ob a, a, an obstruction to the passage of sperm need a surgical extraction of their sperm. This is not an add-on. IVF cannot happen without this procedure, so looking for improved outcomes in this context is irrelevant. So we have to define what we mean by an add-on first of all. And I believe it can be defined as an addition to a specific pathway of care, whether as an additional drug or a therapeutic procedure. But actually, I think it's an unhelpful term in the context of IVF, which by necessity is an envelope of therapy that may vary quite widely according to clinical need. And the key thing here is that the crisis in NHS funding and the lack of adequate funding for IVF in the UK has led to each clinic having to itemize the, the, the different 
um, procedures that may be required in the IVF process. And when this isn't available on the NHS, unfortunately, a charge has to be linked to them. But these are not necessarily um, true add-ons. Also, whilst live birth rate is the key outcome <coughs> measure and something that patients need to know, using this as a sole indicator of an evidence base actually oversimplifies what in reality is a hugely complex process and fails to recognise the significant scientific research which underlies the decisions that we have to make to bring treatments into clinical practice. Take time-lapse imaging for an example. We know that embryo quality is a primary indicator of live birth. We know that morphokinetic data has been shown to indicate embryo quality, and time-lapse imaging combines these two strands of evidence to give justification for its introduction into clinical practice as a diagnostic tool. But as data has evolved, we realize that it not only improves embryo selection, enabling us to reduce multiple pregnancy rates, there is evidence that it reduces miscarriage rates, and the evidence is building up with successive publications. So why should this be ethical, ethically controversial? The key question is, as we gather the data philosophically, at what point should we be bringing treatments into clinical practice? Is it really desirable to wait before we have an adequate sample size when there appears to be benefit and all the data is pointing the same direction? And if fully informed of the status of the evidence, patients have a right to choose. And if it's not available on the NHS, should be given the option to pay if required to do so. Take, for example, cancer treatments. Terminally ill cancer patients are often offered experimental drugs and sometimes may pay for them knowing that they may not be curative and then as the data is collected an evidence base is developed. The randomized controlled trial isn't always the gold standard because the complexity of fertility problems is such that we haven't yet been able to fully individualize treatments in the way that we wish to and RCTs homogenize patient groups when there are many different contributing causes, and whilst an ent intervention may work for a subset of the cohort, it may not show when lumped together. And to have adequately powered RCTs, we need at least a 1,000 patients in each arm of a trial. And sadly, there is insufficient funding in the UK for the research to be able to achieve this. So in summary, do add-ons add up? I think the term add-on is unhelpful. Our focus should be to be absolutely clear about what we're offering. We have to ensure that our patients are properly, fully informed and provided with the evidence as we have it. And of course we have to practice in an ethically sound manner. And the key message behind all of this, which as many of you in the audience will know I'm absolutely passionate about because I'm chairing the NHS England um, committee for trying to improve the funding of IVF in the UK, we have to push more fun for more funding from the NHS for treatment and more funding for research. Thank you. Thank you.